Welcome back, folks, to the Membership Machine Show. This is episode 86. In this episode, we're going to be talking about technical SEO, all the kind of insights, things you need to know to make your site more attractive to Google and other search engines. I've got my regular co-host, Haroon, with me. He seems rather relaxed. He's been on a bit of a break, business and pleasure. Should be a great show. So, Haroon, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers? Certainly. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be on another one of our regular shows again. And today we're discussing uh, one of my favorite topics uh, because I've worked in it for a very, very long time. And uh, SEO was also kind of what got me more and more into development. Uh, so my background been working in the tech industry since 2000, so like 24 years, and uh, with WordPress since the mid-2000s. Uh, so yeah, around a couple of decades. And uh, uh, specific to today's topic, I've worked for publications optimizing their content for SEO uh, to reach millions of views per month. Uh, so yeah, I've got a pretty strong background in that regard, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Wow, that's fantastic. Like I say, before we go into the meat and potatoes of this great show, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. Hi there, e-commerce store owner. At Omnisend, we help more than 100,000 e-commerce customers, just like you, sell their products. We're an all-in-one email and SMS marketing platform that helps you reach your customers, grow your audience, and increase sales. In fact, our customers have seen incredible results with Omnisend averaging $72 in revenue for every single dollar spent. And if you ever have a question, our award-winning customer support team is available 24-7 every single day. That's one of the reasons we have more than 6,000 glowing reviews and ratings all across the web. So get started with Omnisend today and start growing your business with better email and SMS marketing. We're coming back, folks. I want to point out we've got a great resource page if you're looking to build your membership website on WordPress and both me and Haroon think you should be to get these resources which includes a great course at a discount price that will show you how to build a membership website using WordPress from beginning to end plus a load of special offers from the special sponsors plus a, a list of the best plugins and a lot more. You can get all these goodies by going over to wp-tonic.com slash deals. wp-tonic.com slash deals and get all the free resources there. What more could you ask for, may I say? Right, um, so let's do why... Um, the subject is technical SEO fundamentals. Would you like to quickly think why people need to be interested in this and why it's important that they understand the fundamentals, Haroon? <clears throat> sure thing. So for a lot of non-technically inclined people, the idea of having a website out there is just build it, put it on a host, and that's it. The, uh, like the idea that, hey, you just put it out there and they'll come. But that's not how the internet works. So you've got to be discoverable. And in order to be discoverable, uh, you've got to give your site a certain bare minimum criteria that's essential for search engines to start putting it out there in front of uh, visitors who are looking for uh, what you're offering. So if you just build it and put it out there and it's not optimized at a technical level, yes, you may still get some leads. You, you may still uh, drive traffic to it through ads. But when it comes to organic traffic that you don't really have to struggle to receive and that uh, basically um, with, with a good foundation and with good content, it keeps on compounding over time as your authority grows, as your site gets older and older. You lose out on all of that. You always have to spend money in order to get leads, in order to get customers, in order to get business. So that's where SEO and especially technical SEO is very important. <clears throat> now, uh, there are two 
sides of SEO. One is technical SEO that we're covering today. And then there's the other side of uh, SEO that's called off-site SEO. Technical is on-site, whatever you do on your website. And then off-site is uh, what happens on other sites. That's uh, primarily you backlinking to your site. So we're not going to cover any of that. But yes, we are going to cover everything that you can do on your site to uh, boost its rankings. Fantastic. So let's just dive in. So <coughs> uh, on my list of show notes, which I shared with Haroon, we've got um, Quillalitly Main Insight. Create uh, an XML sitemap. Yeah. You know, um, beginners get a bit confused here because you've got a sitemap which lists your post, your pages, which should be available. But this is something totally different. This is linked. Um, my insight to it is it's a separate um, file which yeah. you can then upload to something like Google Search Console. And yeah. it just tells Google that it gives a kind of outline of of the pages on your site to Google and it just helps Google with their crawl crawling of your website. What's your right. insight about this, Aaron? So actually, before we start on specifics of every uh, uh, item in our list, uh, I want to also give a relatively broader overview of what oh. we're doing. Right. Um, so technical SEO or, or which is a part of on-site SEO. On-site SEO is technical SEO plus the actual content you write. But then the content itself needs to be technically sound as well, not just in terms of the value and data it's providing, but in terms of how it's technically structured. So some somewhat uh, uh, of, of an overlap exists between content and uh, te technical SEO as well. So there are including content five major five main aspects of technical SEO. One is pertaining to discoverability of your site. You want your site to be discoverable by search engines and through search engines by users. Second one is the technology stack that you're using because that dictates the site's performance and scalability. And Google takes performance and scalability in mind when it comes to uh, ranking your site. It's one of the factors. It's not the only factor, but it's one of the factors. So yeah, tech stack, hosting, and how the site is built. That's also important. Then there's user experience. What sort of experience do users get when they land on your site? Are they able to find uh, what they're looking for effectively? Uh, are they able to find related articles to what they've actually landed on effectively? Uh, are they able to navigate your site overall effectively or not? So uh, that's, uh, and, and uh, performance also becomes a factor in there. And then there's the content. How is the content structured? The, the volume of content per page, the ratio of content to uh, non-content uh, HTML tags and CSS and JavaScript on the page. Like at, in some cases, pages have very little actual content and a lot of code. Uh, that's, that's also not a good factor often. And uh, then there's metadata, which is information about information, uh, which Google uh, uses to display your content in, in engaging formats. So overall, these are the five areas we're talking about. And uh, now let's del delve into the specifics with what Jonathan started off with. Um, uh, discoverability or uh, crawlability, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's the ability of search engines to be able to crawl and find information on your site and index it in a way to show users. So yeah, an Excel, XML sitemap is different from uh, uh, a visual sitemap for your users. A visual sitemap shows your users, this uses the structure of your site, top level pages and then child pages and then their sub children and all. An XML sitemap in a technical format presents your site structure to search engines, to Google, to Bing, to, to uh, any other search engine you might uh, uh, account for. And using that, those search engines understand how your site is structured and using that they can index the pages of your site. That's how they know how many pages are on your site in the first place often. So that's why having a sound XML sitemap is very important. And you can also exclude different areas of your site from a sitemap that you don't want search engines to crawl. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the importance of the sitemap. Uh, let's move on or would, would you keep on uh, moving yeah, to the I've next got a question. Um, 
as I was doing my reading over the months, years that I've been engaging in this, like yourself to some extent, you got more knowledge on this than me because people are giving you money to do this. I, I've just done it on my own properties. Um, because people are giving you money, I presume that you're more expert at it than me. Um, it's a good idea if you're doing, because it's the frequency of of how often Google indexes your website. I understand if you're doing some fundamental changes through categories or you're adding a lot of content, it's best to generate a new XML um, sitemap and then upload it to your Google console to request Google to re-index the website. Um, but it's only a request, but I think they do, it's all automated. So I think yes. it does help. Am I on the right track here? You're right, yes. Uh, when you first set up your site on Google Search Console, you can provide it with a link to your XML sitemap, and then you don't need to provide it to Google over and over again. You just need to update it on your site because they have the URL to that same file. So whenever you update it on your site, uh, that URL uh, points to the latest and updated version. But yeah, you can go into Search Console and ask it to recrawl the, the sitemap and uh, manually trigger uh, a refresh, but that doesn't guarantee that it will immediately trigger a recrawl uh, because Google does it based on ranking factors, based on how it prioritizes your site. If it sees your site as a as an authority that publishes content frequently, then it's going to crawl your site map more and more frequently to find out about new articles that you've written, new content that you've published. But if you're an obscure uh, site with maybe uh, some changes made every few weeks or months, uh, then Google isn't going to immediately recrawl it. So yeah, over time you build your reputation. That's part of building authority. Next right. is op optimizing yeah. your website's architecture. Yeah, over here, what, what do you, I was wondering what you were going to say about that. Go on. Yeah. So over here by architecture, we mean uh, the, the way pages are structured, the way uh, your site's uh, content is segmented and all. Uh, is, is that what you mean by architecture here, or do you mean the underlying architecture well, of the server? Well, I, I think there's two areas. It seemed to me it kind of covers, it covers um, this concept in SEO of silos. Silos, but, yeah. But that only relates if you get to a certain size of yes. website and a certain size of content production where you you would be best that if you had a subject and it had like four or five sub areas that yeah. you categorize certain amount of your content into separate categories. But then yeah. you got the whole thing about site architecture, which is around optimizing the site. So it loads quickly, especially with mobile, but any yeah. desktop, mobile, whatever scenario that it, is as fast as possible and in some ways the two things are interrelated in some ways because yeah that that's what i think yeah. that means so I think but what the do you first think? one the first one would be more relevant for this section that we're talking about right now oh. um so yeah structuring your site in a way let's let's start with an example let's say you have a you have a local business website and there's a services uh, aspect to it where you highlight all of your services and then there's a blog aspect to it where you uh, post articles uh, discussing or like highlighting case studies maybe of what you've done and then there's a portfolio aspect where you you want to showcase uh, your, your clients so if you've structured them haphazardly Google wouldn't know what piece of content belongs to what part of the site uh, at, at a glance due to the the, the structure not being right uh, but if you have all the blog posts under slash blog slash uh, then the then the actual uh, link of the post. So in this in this uh, uh, particular uh, item, we're going to cover the next one as as well, setting a URL structure because they're they're pretty much very interrelated. So all your blog posts should be together under slash blog slash then the the then the slug of the post. Or let's say you also have a shop. Everything 
pertaining to your shop should be at slash shop slash and then the product uh, category or product link or whatnot or slash store but it should all be under that sort of URL structure all past client projects that you want to feature should be under slash portfolio all case studies should be either in the blog tag case studies or under slash case studies all your services should be under slash services all your locations should be under slash locations that's how Google sees it as a well-structured site rather than a site that just has pages thrown here and there for every uh, uh, thing under the sink. And that's how Google will be able to direct users more effectively to the right pages on your site uh, for the right type of information. Well, so in a way, you're just kind of helping Google, aren't they? Yes. And, and not just yeah. helping Google. Also, you're, you're giving users a better navigational experience on the site as well. So when yeah. users are able to uh, stay on your site and find more and more relevant information rather than clicking back because they were confused on where to go from there. Uh, Google takes us at a good sign, but if they click back because of, uh, 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 because of not being able to find their way around on your site, then Google takes it as a bad sign. Mm. <clears throat> we're like, we're on to URL structure, you know, the URL. We've, we've covered that within yeah. this URL right. structures. Yeah. All right, then let's move on then. Utilizing the robots TXT. Yeah. What what what's your thoughts about this one? Uh, it's a very important file, and in this file, you tell, <clears throat> you basically tell, uh, Google's bot or or other crawlers. So basically, <clears throat> search engines run crawling bots who scan sites and who index their contents. So in robots.txt, you can tell Google whether or not to crawl your site, and uh, you can tell other bots whether or not to crawl your site. And whether or not they respect that is up to them, but most search engines, most reputable search engines respect that, and they don't show in their, uh, um, in their search results uh, any parts of your site that you've told them not to crawl. So that's uh, the importance of robots.txt. Yeah, because um, you can tell um, by code, folks, that there's, and it's, it doesn't sound intuitive, but there's some pages that you probably don't want to be indexed. That doesn't really, um, because you've got something called um, domain authority, and, and some pages contribute to domain authority, but some pages might diminish it. Am I on yeah. the kind of right track there? You're right. And one example is like category and tag archives. So they don't have any unique content of their own. They're meant for people on your site to be able to find content effectively, uh, find related content effectively. But uh, if, the, if you've got a blog archive that already lists an index of all the blog posts, then indexing category archives that index the same posts in different categorization or tag archives for every single tag, there might be a thousand tags on your site. So every single tag archive that lists all posts tagged with that tag without adding any unique content because those posts are already being indexed in their own right. So you, you then might want to uh, remove category archives and tag archives and any other similar archives from being indexed because, hey, uh, someone searching for a keyword, you want them to land on the page that is about that keyword. You don't want them to land on a category page that has like different posts related to that keyword. One, one or more posts could be about that keyword because you want them to be on the page where they can make a decision. Generally, archive pages aren't where, make, where users make decisions. Archive pages are to present uh, related information to users on a site itself rather than uh, in the search engines to get users to land on the actual content page. So you want actual content pages to be indexed primarily. Yeah, it's kind <clears throat> of linked to Google's technology. Obviously, it's very sophisticated in some ways, but in other ways, it's not, it hasn't got the capacity to see that that's a category page. All it sees is, is, um, people hitting a page and leaving yes. very quickly, which yes. is a, a bad in, uh, indication to Google that of the quality of that particular page, which will affect yes. the rest of your website. It hasn't got the capacity to understand that was a category. That's why you've got to sort out 
these things. Yes. And, and the sorry, sorry. Go, ahead. go on. Off you go. And there could be pages like terms and conditions, private privacy policy, legal or other pages that are not relevant to be shown in search results because they aren't conversion pages. They aren't where users are going to land and uh, make a purchase or land and find the information that they're looking for to, inter to engage with your business. And uh, there could be other pages that you've set up intentionally <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to present certain information in a certain way to a certain type of uh, member or, or customer of your site that you're uh, driving sales to directly, that you're bringing traffic to directly via ads. That page is custom built to serve ad traffic. That page may not be suitable for organic search results. So landing pages for specific ad campaigns, you would want that those pages typically to be excluded from search results because you'd have competing content on your site for organic results already. So you don't want pages of your sites to compete with each other to, to uh, find a place, find a spot on the search results page. You want, for one particular topic, you want one authority page in general. So that's, that's why uh, it's important to... Yeah, it's, uh, that's... Um, yeah. I totally agree with you in some ways, but I think it becomes a tricky subject when you're dealing with large... Because they're, they're on the example, the WP Tonic website, I think there might be over 700 blog pages on the WP Tonic website. Um, increasing, increasing the content uh, quite a lot recently over the last two years, but this has been increasing over the past six to seven years. And I do duplicate, not the direct duplicate, but a particular subject, I write different kind of angle doc yeah. pages or posts. So it's a tricky one if you're really duplicating or you're not duplicating. Is that yeah. making any sense, actually? It, it is, because duplicate content from a perspective of SEO and duplicate content from your perspective may be different. From an SEO perspective, duplicate content is essentially the same content, either with same or similar phrasing, or or with with like either with same or with very very similar phrasing without adding any different value. Now, when you're talking about restructure, like duplicating and restructuring a page as a copy with a different angle, then you're adding a lot more value to it. For example same subject covered from the perspective of uh, uh, an e-learning site and then same subject covered from the perspective of uh, uh, of a membership site same perspective covered from uh, same subject covered from perspective of e-commerce site or buddy boss site are going to be four different angles so having four different pages for that covering the same subject is fine because from the seo perspective you're targeting different audiences with each page yeah, that's well put. So, or different segments within the same type of audience, or 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 providing different insights on the same subject, uh, on, on on each of those pages. So, as long as that difference exists, it's fine. But when it comes to pages that don't have such a substantial difference, uh, then you need to have uh, one authority page per any substantial keyword. Well put. On to the next one, add breadcrumb menus. Yeah. Um, I've always got a little bit confused by this particular concept. Obviously, you're having an effective and clear navigation and having a navigation system that's really easy to use on mobile devices. Um, and normally, um, a lot of people, it's probably not, but it's part of this this in my own mind is I think having a, um, a Hamburg menu on a mobile or tablet is is the way you should go but I'm not a great fan of having a mobile navigation on your desktop I I'm, I feel having a more traditional structure when it's viewed on a desktop is yes, still beneficial I agree. but I, I agree. notice 
this oscillates. Uh, there are a lot of websites that just have the Hamburg kind of navigation of a desktop for all device views. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I've gone off the beaten track, but it's all under the thin menus, isn't it? So what do you no, but, think but, of breadcrumb menus? Over here, we're talking about breadcrumb menus, which, which give the uh, navigational hierarchy of where you are on the site, not the yeah. overall na uh, top level navigation menus. For example, right above the content, you might see you are here, home, colon, shop, colon, product name, or yeah. home, colon, blog, colon, and then blog post name. So those navigational menus are called uh, uh, breadcrumb menus because they're like the idea of tracing back your steps from where you are all the way to home. So they serve two purposes, if implemented correctly. And good SEO plugins let you implement all that we're talking about correctly. M well, much of it help you do it. You've got to do it, but they help you with it. So good SEO plugins let you add breadcrumb menus in a way that they show up on the site as well, in a like an area above the content or below the content or both. and they also add the necessary metadata uh, about that 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 uh, hierarchical navigation of where you are on the site so that in google search results google also shows that page's result with a with a hierarchical navigation above it so within the search results people can see that you are at the domain slash product slash product name rather than Google just showing you a URL. You might notice in some search results, instead of showing the URL, Google shows you like a, a, a navigational breadcrumb track of where you land on the site. So that helps in uh, building uh, sort of a, well, it makes your, uh, makes your uh, search result stand out and it can uh, encourage clicks to different sections of the site within the search results themselves, rather than people landing on the site and then going to different sections. They might click part of th that breadcrumb structure in the search results to uh, go to some other area of your site as well, which is a good thing, as long as they're landing on your site. If that means they've found the right area within the search result, rather than going to the, pe the page and then navigating to where they want it to be. Oh, great. What's your remark about the bit I was talking about? Ah, uh, yes. Amber? Would you agree so, with the, what I basically outlined? It's all about the right user experience on a site that may have only uh, like very, very few navigation menu items. Presenting yeah. them up, up and center would be a great idea. But a site with a, with a way more of a mega menu type of situation, then there are two options. One is just using a conventional horizontal mega menu up top on which you click or uh, hover to expand the menu or using a bread, breadcrumb navigation that slides in a, 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 the same menu as the mobile menu from left or right. I've seen that succeed on many e-commerce sites. Yeah, yeah, I see where you So it also with. depends on the type of site we're talking about. E-commerce yeah. sites with lots and lots and lots of categories, they can really benefit. And some use a hybrid of both. They uh, you utilize the top, of, uh, the, uh, the, the top of the navigation bar area for a mega menu with with their uh, key offerings with like their sales so there might be many for sales special offers what's new and what not and then for the complete cat categorical mega menu they might have a slide out All right um use pagnine pagination uh, yeah i yeah. struggle with that word thank you yeah. what's this about so pagination is where uh as opposed to scrolling down to get more and more articles loaded, you actually scroll down at the end of the page to the end of the page to see a link to move on to the next page to see more results or go back to the previous page. This is applicable on archives, like your products archive or a category archive or main blog posts archive. So uh, using pagination lets Google see and effectively find all of your second page, third page, fourth page listed articles products on second page, third page, fourth page. If you're using load more, then Google might not crawl beyond the, the first uh, 10 or first 20 or first nine or first whatever number of uh, items that load when, when Google actually crawls that web page. Because Google is not, Google's bot isn't actually using the mouse's scroll wheel. It's only getting uh, your site's code via, via an HTTP request. So whatever first loads is what it sees. So that's why for better discoverability, uh, pagination works. But then this could be countered with the fact that if you've got all of those, 
all of those articles directly in your XML sitemap, then Google might not need to, uh, Google bots, Google's bot might not need to crawl to page two, page three, page four and all just to be able to find them. It'll be able to find them, all of those articles in the sitemap and then crawl them directly as well. So uh, it's not as important as you might think, but uh, using pagination also gives a better user experience in certain types of sites. So yeah, yeah. there you go. That was well put. Well, I think we've uh, covered some interesting stuff. Hopefully we haven't blown your minds away. Um, you'll be able to find all this information in the supporting show posts that will go up, which will be in the podcast or video. If you're watching this on YouTube, it will be in the video description. We're going to go for our break and we will be back for our second half and we'll be delving all giving you all the knowledge you need around technical seo we'll be back in a few moments folks tired of hosting providers that can't handle high traffic loads convesio is here to help our platform can handle any amount of traffic all without slowing down or crashing with immediate slack support performance optimization and a team that thrives on resolving technical challenges, your e-commerce business is in safe hands. Learn more about Convesio at Convesio.com. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. We're coming back, folks. Want to point out we've got a fantastic free group community resource. It's on Facebook. It's the Membership Machine Facebook group. It's a mixture of WordPress people, developers, and people like yourself trying to build a great, successful membership community website. Like I say, it's a totally free resource. We love you to go over there and join. Like I say, it's the Membership Machine Show Facebook group. So go over there and join. Um, so off, on we go. Um, so indexability insights. Unblock search bolts from accessing your pages. Yeah, well, this is notorious. What's your... What's your thoughts about this and what people need yeah. to know, Arun? So it seems in this section, we're going to cover uh, problems that people often face in terms of technical SEO and uh, how or why to fix them. So yeah, first one, unblock search bots from accessing pages. So at times, uh, people are like, we've got this page and Google is just not uh, showing, showing it in any of the search results for relevant keywords. And then we find out that when they had built that page, during the process of building it or due to some reason or the other it was just not ready yet they had set it to no index and that's something that you can set at a page level as well you can tell google in your robots.txt and xml sitemaps about your site of what pages it has and what to crawl and what not to crawl but if you want to block a page from being crawled at an individual page level, you don't want to go and rewrite your robots.txt file. You can just do it at that page level uh, by setting it to no index. And uh, uh, that blocks search, block search bots from crawling it. But once you've had it ready and you've hit publish, if you've forgotten to take that no index off from your SEO plugin settings, you'd be pulling your hair out and that why is it not being indexed? So that's the first thing to check. All of your pages that need to be crawled by Google, once they're ready, once they're published, once they're in their final form, you should make sure that they don't have uh, no index on because that would block them from search engines uh, access. Yeah. Um, also WordPress has a global setting. It's not switched on, I think, automatically. But if yeah. somebody, if your site, you're building a site and you don't want the site indexed until it's ready for live launch, 
a lot of people switch that on and yes. they forget to switch it off and then oh, two yes. months later um the site's not been in text at all because Google, one thing google is pretty good in honoring these um settings and i've seen yeah. that a few times where oh, yes. a site's not been indexed at all because they've got that particular option tick terminate yeah so you you need to make sure you go into your uh wordpress settings and then reading area there and there's an option called search engine visibility there there's a checkbox that says discourage search engines from indexing this site make sure that it's enabled make sure that the checkbox is checked while you're developing the site so that during like before the pages are ready google would not index it google would not crawl it but then once you're done developing the site make sure you uncheck it and save changes so that now you're telling google that hey we're ready we're up for business we've opened shop now come and uh, help others find us give us some business I think we touched this in the first half, remove duplicate content. And I'd say it's a bit yeah. tricky. Is there anything further you want to say about that? Or should we move on to the next one? Yeah, well, if you're uh, coming across uh, difficulty in ranking a particular page and another page is being ranked, and the one that you want isn't being ranked, then you might want to uh, make sure that the one authority page that you want ranked the most on that particular subject is uh, set to canonical um th that's that's a trick where let's say you you need to have multiple pages with very similar content with with almost identical content and instead of unindexing many of them or setting them to no index you can set uh, you can decide which is the canonical page which is the the page that is the source that is the main page that is the primary page and then you can set the canonical attribute the canonical url for all of the other pages to that one to the one that you want indexed so because i've had clients who had multiple pages on their site on the same subject and they were all important pages but they were there was a substantial enough duplication so in that case they didn't want to remove those pages altogether so uh, page c was being ranked when they wanted page a to be ranked not even page b a page that in their hierarchy of importance was c third that was being ranked and the first one wasn't. So Google had decided that page C was the right page on your site for that type of information, but you disagreed. So once you set page C to basically redirect uh, authority to page A, Canonical doesn't redirect visitors from that page, nor does it redirect bots from that page. It, it redirects the authority of that page to the actual page that you want to be core of authority on that subject. But it better be related. If it's a completely different type of uh, content page, then you're misusing, abusing uh, canonical attribute. Right. Thanks for that insight. That's a useful bit of knowledge. Um, audit your redirects. This is a oh, yes. because there's soft redirects and there's hard redirects, um, yeah. and you got to understand. So, what what would you like to share on this particular subject? So uh, you need to know for sure, uh, like have a complete picture of what URLs of your site that are indexed are redirecting, redirecting users to other parts of the site. And uh, um, so uh, soft redirect is more of a, uh, like, how do we explain it? It's temporary temporary uh, no like this temporary and then there's permanent uh soft redirect is generally uh it's it's like let me let me give you an example at times you visit certain site and then you're visiting a particular URL, you click it and then you see that URL in the browser top bar for a while, for a little while. And then on the page, it might say redirecting in three, two, one or whatever. And then you redirect it. You land on that page, you land on that mm -hmm. link and then you redirect it. That's a soft redirect. A hard redirect is when at DNS level or at web server level usually at web server level, you hit that web URL, and then the web server decides that, hey, 
I want to actually land you on that particular page. So no content of that first link loads. No content of the source link loads, only the content of the destination link loads. And in the browser's top bar, the source link automatically turns to a destination link without any activity on that page. So that's more of a hard redirect. Uh, and <clears throat> you want to avoid soft redirects to the maximum extent possible because they are a poor user experience above yeah, all else. A hearty, dumb one. Horrible, horrible user experience. Yeah, yeah. I have no so idea any, what. Is there any practical reason for doing it? Well, I, I don't. I don't think I've found one no. good use case for them ever. No. I personally haven't, unless there is some information that you want to provide to users about why they are being redirected from this page to yeah. another one. For example, in 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 some cases, depending on your audience, in some cases it might be important to have your audience land on it, see that they're on the right URL and then show them a message that, hey, this page has moved and the new URL is this, redirecting you in three, two, one, or click here to be redirected. So that's that's one uh, use case that's legit, depending on your target audience. Here's a real biggie one, in my opinion, check the mobile responsiveness of your site. Oh yes. And it's something when people are trying to build their website themselves and they haven't got a lot of experience, obviously choosing a quality page builder like Cadence or um, if you're going Gutenberg or Bricks or whatever or Alimator maybe, uh, building something that's reasonably can, and choosing a, a quality starter theme or starter site helps. But you can soon, if you start move, uh, moving stuff around and uh, changing things in a quite dramatic way, you, if you haven't got the experience, you, it, you can really end up with a bit of a dog's breath when it comes to mobile usage. And it's so important. So what's your views about this one, Haroon? <clears throat> one of the most important ranking factors, I'd say, because a vast majority of people browse uh, most websites on their mobile, on the mobile phones or tablets. Most of them are on mobile devices. So uh, Google considers this as uh, pretty much the deal breaker in, in ranking factors. Uh, so yes, when building your site, it should be one of your top priorities to make sure that it's optimized for mobile. And that's not just uh, making sure that anything that is in a three column on desktop turns into two columns on tablet and one column on uh, mobile and that's it. No, while uh, avoiding side scrolling is important because users don't want to scroll horizontally while browsing your, your website. They only want to scroll vertically. So if they want to scroll, if they have to scroll horizontally to access some content, or if there's some content off screen on a horizontal side on left or right, uh, that's a bad user experience, very bad search experience, uh, sorry, search ranking factor. Uh, but that's one factor. You've got to also make sure that typography, uh, text sizes, font weights and all, and spacing between items, they are also optimized for mobile because you don't want a user to be clicking uh, the second item in the navigation when they aim to click the first one, tap the first one because fingers are thicker than the, the, the pointy uh, mouse cursor on your, on your screen. So uh, you want to make sure that any links are spaced adequately to be able, for users to be able to tap the right one. And links need to be sized properly. Links need to have enough padding around them to separate them from content properly. There needs to be a good contrast ratio between elements for good accessibility, but that's beyond just mobile. That's uh, for mobile and desktop. And uh, mobile navigation needs to be optimized for mobile. Mobile, uh, 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 what you call it, what you may call it, uh, um, performance, yeah. Uh, so there may be certain heavy scripts and uh, animations and interactivity uh, that that might work better on desktop because PCs generally are far more powerful than mobile phones. But you might not want that extremely complex JavaScript animation uh, or WebGL animation to run on a phone that's running on a 3G connection or patchy 4G service. Uh, 
uh, one might not always be in a great uh, coverage area. So yeah, you need to count and factor in all of these things when uh, building a mobile experience. Because As that is my, an extremely um, important ranking factor. Sorry, my right? experience is this is the major problem with Alimator. Um, was it, and to some extent, you'll also Divi, um, was on the mobile side where something like Cadence on the Gutenberg or Bricks or Breakdance, <clears throat> um, you get a much better performance matrix on mobile and that's why building choosing the right page builder is important would you agree with that yes i completely agree uh, i had to like coming from elementor to bricks i had to do a lot more make a lot more efforts into mobile optimization on elementor compared to what i have to do now with bricks plus automatic css because or uh, like any good css framework because that does a lot of things for you be it core framework be it automatic css be it any other good css framework using that uh, gives you scalable typography out of the box you just have to use it the right way it gives you scalable spacing out of the box you have to just use it the right way implement it the right way so far better experience on uh, using the right tools <clears throat> right um fix fixing or fix http errors yeah errors so what's that's this like about? a no-brainer it's a no-brainer. Yeah. You don't want people to land on your site and run into an error rather than seeing the information that they were expecting Google to see. does not like a yeah. site that has any of these. Or oh, yes. It, it really doesn't like it, does it? So if there's a broken link or if your server is uh, uh, throwing some error because of some uh, poor code on a page, like some PHP script gone rogue and consuming way too many resources for the server to be able to respond uh, by like loading the page properly in, in a timely manner, uh, you don't want any of that because Google will de-index pages. Even if you had a really good authority page indexed and was getting good traffic to your site, the moment Google detects that it's giving a 404, it's going to stop showing that to people because it doesn't want people to, to land on a page that doesn't uh, work. So make sure that in case you rename links, in case you move pages to different uh, pages, different URLs, you always have redirections in place to make sure that the previous URL is getting them to the right destination. And avoid it in the first place if you can. Avoid an authority pages uh, link to be changed in the first place because Google is associating that link with the content on the page. But if you have to for some reason, uh, then instead of 404, it should be redirecting. Yeah, and I'll, make sure yeah. that your server and your 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 content uh, your your code code base is uh, adequate enough to not throw other type of errors other than 404 as well rankability insights internal yeah. and external linking what's your thoughts about this one <clears throat> yeah so internal linking is also extremely important uh, because it lets people find relative relevant content on your site uh, for what they're currently browsing. If they're currently browsing um, uh, a particular type of product, let's say a microphone on your site, you've got a site that uh, sells audiovisual equipment. If you're selling a microphone, uh, if you've got a page about talking about microphone, then <clears throat> you might want to link it to pages talking about audio interfaces because someone looking for a microphone would maybe want to look for audio interfaces as well. So it, it fosters engagement within your site, which is good for your sales which is good for uh, your page views, which is good for your conversions. And it's a good uh, search engine factor as well, because Google uh, realizes that you've linked relevant content together. So people are going to have a good experience on your site. So let's send people to your site. But at the same time, if you're linking irrelevant stuff, if you're throwing in uh, uh, a link of, uh, um, like if you're linking pages of, uh, like pages covering kitchen utensils on uh, an article that's uh, that talks about microphones and headphones. Uh, that's not going to be a good ranking factor. So uh, sensible internal linking. And also, <clears throat> if you've got a 300 word article and you've got 50 internal links in that 300 word article, Google is going to see your site as less about providing information, more about making people visit pages on your site. But if you've got a thousand or 5,000 word article and you've got even a hundred links in it, that makes more sense because uh, 
it's it's the ratio of the actual auction number of words in that content to the links that you've got. So there's no magic number that, hey, you've got to have five internal links on a page. If it's a 5,000 word article, five links would be way too little. Then maybe 50 links would be more like it. But if it's a 300 word article, then even 10 links would be way too much. Then five links or two, three, four links would be more reasonable. External linking is also important, especially if you are providing information sourced from other sources, uh, brought in from other sources. Let's say you're a publication and you uh, don't come up with uh, like your own breaking stories all the time. You have to report stories that others have broken. So not linking to the original source would uh, give Google the indication that you're more into plagiarism and not giving credit. So there's that. And then also, if you're not going to link out to others when you find good content for them from them, why are others going to link back to you when they find good content on your site? So it's also great for relationship building. Uh, like a Wall Street Journal article linking to a Times article, uh, it's not like they're they're uh, like it's not like hey, why should we give uh, our competitor a backlink? It's more about when you break a story, the Times article would. Uh, uh, give a link back to the Wall Street Journal article that you write when you're the one breaking the story as well. So it's important to build relationships within the industries that you work in as well. The more quality backlinks you give, the more quality backlinks you're also going to get, provided, of course, that you also produce quality content. But then, yeah. again, uh, last thing again about this, always make sure that the backlinks are relevant. Irrelevant backlinks are going to do you more harm than good. Yeah. Very insightful, very important. Um, Which brings us I, to the next one, backlink quality. Yeah, that, sorry, go that ahead. covers that. Content yeah. clusters. I think we've covered that in... Yeah. In, you, we've in the that. link structure, yeah. In the yeah. URL structure, we've, we've covered content clusters. So let's go on to clickability insights. Um, yeah. Use structured data. What, that, what, oh, what yeah. do you think that means? So that's metadata that tells search engines in a yeah. in a in a sort of a highly structured manner. That's not like user readable data for the end users. Users would have to browse the source, the HTML source of the site to see that data. But it tells search engines what this content is about. So using that sort of structured data, you can tell Google that hey, this page is all about uh, video content. So you can tell Google about like details about the particular video that you've embedded in it. Or if it's an event site, you can tell Google, hey, this is a particular event. This is the start date. This is the end date. This is the venue. Uh, this is the genre. If it's a if it's a videos and uh, sorry, if it's a music or movies website, you can tell Google this is the genre. This is the artist. This is the the um, uh, producer. This is the director. So the more information Google knows about it, the better position it will be in to send people to your site about uh, like uh, like when it comes to searches about that particular content and your search result with the right implementation of structured data your search results will stand out in google's uh, search results pages they will st they will show snippets of a video they will show snippets of uh, they will show details from an event start date and end date they would show uh, uh, like a title of a book like a cover of a book, ISBN, etc., right in the search results page without people having to first come to your site. So that will increase the chances of them clicking through and coming to your site because they see a visual representation that this page is indeed about what we're looking for. I've been <clears throat> implementing a summary of the of the article right at the top of the page and underneath it a table of content. But yeah, uh, for about four months now four to five months every article we produce we do a small summary on the top and then we do a con uh, table of content do you think that helps oh yes table of content is a great way to uh, indicate to google uh, that hey you might not just want to show this page this uh, individual uh, pages link only these are the links within the page that you can show as additional information with that search result. So that really makes your search results stand out. It's not guaranteed that Google will start showing that right away, but the more you do it and the like 
the longer you do it, the higher the chances that your search results are going to come, uh, are, are going to show up with uh, that sort of additional rich information within the search results page itself. And on the right of all the posts that we do, we have a list of relevant posts that have sim you know, might be of interest. And um, we have about 10 to 15 of those posts in every and I think that helps as well. Would you agree? Oh, yes, it does. Absolutely. Agree. Right. Win SERP features. What's that about? We've just spoken about it as a, as a yes. like this is the benefit you get when you use structured data. Right. And Optim then the last one, optimize for feature snippet is what we've already covered. So we've covered all three of these within the within one, because when you use structured data, you're optimizing for getting feature snippets, you're telling uh, search engines, you're not just giving them the content, you're telling them about what content it is. And you're give, giving it more and more information about what you're talking about here on this page. And then it can uh, give you different features on the search results pages. It can show your content in snippets, in featured snippets, in optimized manner on the search results page. So featured snippets are like a specific type of optimized uh, output of uh, content on uh, a search results page. Um, when someone is searching for, let's say, um, uh, 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 a particular uh, type of uh, fishing hooks, like what type of fishing hooks to use for, uh, for what type of fish. So if you've built enough authority and provided enough relevant information use, using uh, um, uh, rich content, using uh, metadata and all, and built enough authority over the years, Google might show an excerpt of from your uh, post with images on top of the on top of the title and the link uh, in some snippets in the very first search result. So that is like a feature snippet, and uh, that's going to give your audience information before they click on uh, the page. And usually, uh, that it, like in in most industries that increases engagement. But in some industries, that may actually be a hindrance that may decrease engagement because, hey, users have just found what they're looking for right on the search results page. So uh, why bother clicking? So yeah, uh, you, you've got to keep that in mind as well. And to finish, um, so I would say everything we've outlined, folk, or Haroon's outlined with a little bit of help for me or hindrance, um, it's, they're not much. They are important in the totality because if you've got a site that's riddled with these type of mistakes, you can have really great content on it, but you will just not get the results that you're hoping for because it's riddled with problems that we've outlined in this show. Would you would you agree with that, Harun? I, I completely agree because while one particular factor may not derank your site or bring it like uh, 10, sp 10 places down on the search results page, all of them combined may do that. So um, yeah, every little bit counts because of the sheer amount of competition out there, every little bit counts. So you've got to cover all of your bases. That's why every single one of these points is important. All right, I think we're, I think we're end it now. What's the best way for people to find out more about you and your insights, Haroon? So they can find me at hqraja.com, H-Q-R-A-J-A. -A, that is for Haroon Q Raja, my first initial, middle initial, and raja.com. And uh, there's a contact form over there using which they can reach out to me and I'll be happy to help. Yeah, you'll find Haroon's contact details in the show notes for this particular podcast, which you will find on the wp-tonic doc website. But all Haroon's content information and link to his website will be in the supporting show notes with the video and audio part of this podcast i think it's been a great show i think we've given a lot of value in this episode um i did a show last week and haroon did a show the week 
before that where we covered everything around SEO. So I think you, if you really want a real good understanding of SEO applied to your membership website, listen to all of those three podcasts and look at the support your show notes. And I think you have a great resource, folks. We will be back next week with either another internal show or re-interviewing a guest. We've got some great guests coming up in August. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye.